Hello, everybody. My name is Tim Spector. I am Professor of Genetic Epidemiology at King's College London. And as you probably know, I'm the Director of the Department of Twin Research and Twins UK. And I'm joined today by Debbie. Hello, I'm Deborah Hart, and I'm the Executive Director at the Department and Twins UK. Welcome to our webinar. Now, um, twins have asked us a few questions, haven't they, Debbie? Yes, we, we're having a series of webinars celebrating 30 years. This is our 30th anniversary. And through the month of September, we're celebrating you and your contribution to research and also what we've achieved using all of the data um, that you've given us over the 30 years. So there's a series of webinars. Today, we're talking about the background of twins and the history of twins. And we have asked you to send us questions about all the topics that we're going to be covering over the few weeks. Um, so I'm going to start by asking Tim some of the common questions that you've answered. So the most common question that a lot of twins want to know, Tim, is how did the department start and what gave you the idea to set up a, a twin register? Well, you know, we're, we're here now celebrating the 30th anniversary of Twins UK. And uh, this is really important because this is all uh, due to all of you guys, because without your support, we couldn't have done this, made all our discoveries and uh, got our act together. And Debbie and I both started this back in 1992. Um, and it's amazing because we really haven't uh, changed at all in that time. Uh, uh, you know, I now use a bit of white hair dye, make myself look a bit more uh, senior. Um, but uh, it's been quite a journey. Um, and so going, thinking back where, what actually was going on 30 years ago, um, we had this, some of you might have known that we had this other study called the Chingford study, where, which was like a sort of practice run for twins. We had a, a thousand women at a, at a general practice in Chingford, and we were looking at things like arthritis in them. And uh, and osteoporosis and found that a lot of them had family histories. And so that uh, made me think, well, maybe we should be studying genetics more than just uh, sort of old age as it was, it was called then. And that's really where I had this sort of aha moment to think, well, the best way to study genetics is, and nature v nurture is through twins. And that's really uh, how we, we got going. Um, and initially we had just only, I think it was about 200 identical twins were all we really aimed at. We weren't, we weren't very brave initially because uh, we thought, oh, it'd be really hard to find these because, you know, we, you hardly ever come across more than two pairs. Um, and we had this, um, this other insight that we, obviously we needed non-identical twins once we started looking into this, because without the non-identicals, you can't really use the data from a lot of the identicals, got nothing to compare it to. Um, then we started these media campaigns, didn't we, Debbie? Um, and um, I think, what was your favorite one uh, that we did? I think it was one of the newspapers, wasn't it? So. We, did, we did a lot. The Daily Mail scientific editor was very, very keen on, on um, our studies. Um, and we had things on Good Morning Britain, I think, but we also, and one of our, we had a telethon and we had a big spread in the media and everyone in the department at that time was on the telephones because twins were just, it, it was about 5,000 twins in one go registered at that time. So that got us going, I think. And now we have nearly 16,000 twins on the register. So over 30 years, we certainly have grown. Yeah, and uh, our team was a bit small in 1992. It was Debbie, myself, and I think we had Mary, and maybe some other uh, part-time uh, person. But it was it was pretty uh, basic, um, and we sort of uh, used to borrow people from other other places to fill in to help us as things got very big. But you know, big difference to now the, the over 70 people we have in that department, and. Um, it's a huge, huge operation, isn't it, Debbie, now? 
It is operational teams, academics who write the grants, a huge lab. We've got um, something like 40 freezers and a big freezer park full of your samples. Um, you know, probably nearly close to a million samples altogether. And the data is vast that we've collected. So huge storage areas of data. Yeah, and of course, lots of people have done their PhDs and uh, fellowships, uh, both doc not doctors and, and uh, non-doctors. And uh, yeah, it's uh, been amazing. And of course, hundreds of papers, I think we sort of lost count really at about 700, but um, it's oh, probably yeah. more. About, about 100 papers a year, and we have over a thousand collaborators at similar sort of institutions as ours. Um, academic researchers in, in the scientific community who work with us to write papers. So it, it's really huge. And so the twins have actually asked about the research, Tim, and in those 30 years, what has been the sort of biggest discoveries that, that we've made with, with twin, our twins? Oh, it's, that's always a tricky question I, I get asked. Um, and I think it sort of depends because it, it sort of is it the biggest impact at the time or when you look back, you know, 30 years. And it's a sort of bit of a mixture of both because, you know, what really changed people's minds. And I think what twin studies have done is really changed direction of research at crucial moments. I think that's what its, it's real value is. And I think a good example is, is when we, we did the first studies of, of knee arthritis, knee osteoarthritis, and back pain. And up to that point, doctors, universities said, it's just wear and tear. There's nothing you can do about it. It's not interesting. It's really boring. And um, go away and come back, you know, when you need a wheelchair. And, it, um, and realizing that back pain was actually three times more heritable than breast cancer, really did have an impact on changing a whole idea of osteoarthritis and hopefully stop this, this idea that all these things were inevitable. And um, I think that, and, and that people should take a family history when they're discussing anybody with a musculoskeletal problem. They don't have to have just one of the rare diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. So I think that was um, really, really important in seeing that, you know, uh, 60% of the difference between people in terms of their uh, arthritis of the spine or back pain is due to genes rather than environment. I think that was a really big thing. Um, obviously, we've had lots of gene discoveries. Um, we've, you know, um, the human genome came around um, in uh, 2003. Um, we did some heritabilities around this time, just before they started using the genes to try and identify which ones are associated with the disease. Um, things come to light, the discoveries for short-sightedness being uh, very inheritable, cataracts as well. Um, obviously, we've mentioned osteoarthritis, osteoporosis. I think finding genes for vitamin D levels in the blood was a really exciting moment because it showed that um, actually we vary much more than we think. There isn't one standard amount of vitamin D that's good for everybody. A lot of people exist on very different levels and that genes control that. Um, and that's helped lots of other diseases. I think, uh, you know, with perhaps twin studies are perhaps covered over a hundred different diseases, I think, uh, over the time. Um, those of you know, we dabbled with something called epigenetics, and that was where twins came into their own, particularly identical twins, because um, they have the same genes in all the cells in their body, whereas non-identicals have half, the, half of them. But we knew that um, identical twins weren't exactly the same because their genes were tweaked by little chemicals. They were like little dimmer switches on and off and they could turn those genes on and off. And I think that was a really interesting insight. And we did a lot of really important research in the early days of understanding this 
epigenetics uh, that was could only be done really with twins. Um, but I think for me, one of the sort of highlights was the uh, finding something that was really different, uh, and that was the microbiome, the, this community of gut microbes in our colon. And I was convinced this was going to be genetic and we would see greater similarities in identical twins compared to non-identicals. And it turned out there's virtually no difference. So that the gut microbes that are so important for our health are not influenced to any real extent by our genes at all. It's all by our upbringing and what we eat, uh, our environment, whether we live in the country or, or the city and whether we've got pets or not. So that was uh, a real big shock, not just for me, but for the whole of the um, scientific community. And more recently, we've sort of, as well as doing microbiome work, gut health work, we're into nutrition. And again, twins came into their own in the PREDICT study, you know, run uh, in conjunction with our department and the, the company Zoe, where, most of the people in this study of a thousand people were twins and we showed that the genetics only had a very small component on how people responded their blood sugar responded to say a muffin uh, so at most 30 percent for glucose and only like five percent for blood fats so how you respond to fat is absolutely not genetic at all so all these things have switched us from 30 years ago, where we started in the idea that everything was due to old age and degeneration, then we started thinking everything's genetic. And now we're sort of saying, well, actually, uh, it's not all genetic and there's a lot of things you can do yourself. And, and through all the science that we've done, Tim, if you could say there was one discovery that was your sort of wow moment in 30 years, what, what was that? I think it actually was the gut microbiome being no different between identical and non-identical twins. Um, that was a wow moment because it suddenly, for me, explained this conundrum that if you know identical twins who are like clones, um, if genes are important, they should always get the same diseases. They should get the same cancer. They should, um, you know, die at the same time. Um, and they don't, we, you know, endless examples where that's not the case. Yes, they may look alike. Yes, superficially, they seem similar. But inside, there was something else that was very different. And it turns out that this organ in their bodies, the microbiome, uh, was totally different. So it's producing different chemicals. And I think this was great because it, it really highlighted the fact that one of the big parts of our body that we can modify through our diet and our lifestyle is, is changeable. And so we can change our destiny. We can't, it's not about just blaming our parents, as, as I think we, we thought 25 years ago, uh, which is really good news for all of us because, uh, you know, um, it means we can all improve. And, and one of the, one of the, more common questions again from twins is how how much has changed since we joined the register in the early 90s with what we're doing now well um those twins who are listening who came on those first visits realized how crude it was in those days and it wasn't the days of the internet and uh it, it was the days of the fax machine and um and everything done by post and um, we had a few simple questions. It was all done on paper. Um, they had some bloods done, but we couldn't afford to do many because they were actually much more expensive than they are now. Um, now it's very different. We have visits that can last all day. We're taking multiple blood draws because each we can you know, do hundreds of tests from a single drop of blood, which we couldn't do before. Uh, new technology means we can give you wearables to take home, to measure your sleep, your exercise, your uh, glucose levels, uh, your heart rate. Um, and 
we're using these mobile phones instead of questionnaires now to record what's going on. So you can do things in real time that um, were just not possible back then. You know, it took months to collect all the data and post it and send it back to us. And then uh, months of us to analyze it with these apps, as we saw with uh, during COVID, you know, the data that uh, the twins produced in, in, in COVID, we could, within a matter of weeks, uh, we had those, those data published and ready to go. So the COVID really helped us accelerate this change from the very so primitive, doing everything in a very in a hospital-based scenario to doing things at home. And I think 5,000 of you actually gave us your own blood samples and sent it back to us, which was amazing. And this is really pioneering a lot of studies around the world now who, where we've, we've led the way uh, in, uh, in it together because it, obviously you guys being so cooperative um, makes it so much easier and, and willing to, to do new things. And, and of course, we, you know, all sorts of manner of samples that you've been collecting at home has been very innovative. And as Tim says, we share a lot of our methodology of how, how they can be collected with other groups similar to ours. So you really have paved the way by being so receptive and responsive to doing these sorts of studies. And during COVID, when we couldn't access the, the, the clinic area at St. Thomas's, because obviously it was all taken over to COVID and trials for vaccines, we set up our own department, our own clinic department. So for those people who have been in more recently, just, um, sort of March of this year, we actually now, you come and have visits in our department. And some of our studies that we wanted to carry on, we actually did even over Zoom. So we had nurses on Zoom and you were doing assessments at home and they were measuring you. So I think COVID has taught us to be even more innovative and creative and to save you having to all come in now there are there is so much more we can do at home so that definitely is is changing and, and very exciting to do so tim lastly we've got one more question interesting one is there a cutoff age when your twinfulness isn't useful for research anymore a simple answer is no uh being a twin for research is like an, an eternal gift that just keeps giving. And uh, even if you are unable to come for visits or uh, get ill health, or even as happens to all of us, you know, die, um, your data lives on and we will continue to use it uh, because this is really crucial, these endpoints of working out who lives the longest, who lives the shortest, what people die of, um, and all this stuff is uh, going to be useful, not just to us, but also future generations of researchers who will take over from uh, Debbie and I, as well as newer, newer twins who are then also joining this, this amazing research community. So um, I think particularly important as we're all uh, getting more and more engaged in how to uh, age slower and uh, you know as we um, this is definitely on all of our minds how to uh, maximize enjoyment in old age so we do need all this data uh, progressively but it's uh, yeah absolutely there's no no end to it we've had several twins in, um, who were 100 still active and uh, we, we keep wanting to break the record of the, the oldest twin pair we have. So do keep it up if you're out there. You're, yeah, you're out there somewhere. OK, well, thank you. Thank you for joining us uh, for our first webinar. Look out for the others that are coming. And we want to celebrate you and the 30 years that you've contributed to this amazing scientific program. So enjoy the rest of the webinars and thank you. And thanks to all of you for supporting us for 30 years. You've been absolutely amazing and we love you all. Goodbye.